Seaway, I always light up when people ask me about her. I love the opportunity to talk about her. She was smart, witty, friendly, talented. Um, smart doesn't even say it enough. Uh, I call her my beautiful black butterfly. She did flit from place to place and shed a little light and love. She loved math. She loved tutoring. Um, so many stories. I think one of my favorite stories about her intelligence and connecting to people. My family's from St. Thomas, so she spent a summer in St. Thomas and she stayed with one of my cousins. And while she was there, I'd call and check on her, but not too much because she was also homesick. And so I'd speak to my cousin. I heard these kids talking in the background and I'm like, who is that? And she's like, that's your daughter. And I was like, what? Because they have the really strong patois or the lilt, the St. Thomian accent. And I was like, that's my daughter. She goes, yes, she sounds like everybody here now. And um, so she put her on the phone. She's like, oh, mommy, I have this great story to tell you. And I'm like, what? She goes, I wrote this story. I wrote, I wrote this piece at school. And I'm like, all right. I was like, why don't you read it to me? And she started reading me a, a math word problem. <laughs> and I was like, what? And she read it again. And I was like, she loves math and words so much. That was her story. And she was tutoring people. She was like seven years old, tutoring people that were older than her because math was one of her passions. She had a really interesting gift of things. She didn't think she was a good artist, but her art was good. She played guitar, she danced, she played soccer, um, she ran, um, she wrote. She had published, not, excuse me, not published, she had written almost 17 chapters of a book before she passed. And she had finished her children's book. So my friends and I were talking that that's on the list. You know, she's been gone eight years. And I'm in a good place now, mentally and physically, to look at how can I get like a, the children's book published, because that's done. And then just um, a book of her unpublished works or incomplete, because the novel wasn't finished. But she had actually met with, um, I think, Hatchet, Hatchet Publishing Group. Mm -hmm. um, she might have been 13 at that time. And she met with an illustrator, a publicist, and a editor. So I was like, this young girl, preteen, teen, sitting down at a publishing company having a meeting about her book. And a friend of mine had arranged that because I would send him her stuff going, you know, is it any good? Should I pursue this? And he was like, I can't tell you exactly what he said. He goes, but she's really <laughs> talented because he was jealous. He was like, I can't read any more of her stuff. So I'm going to start writing like her. She's really good. Um, so just a fun, talented kid, but also really stressed and worried and troubled. So at the same time, she'd be bubbly and happy and help everybody. She'd come home and cry, and you're like, what happened? And, you know, and I'd be sitting somewhere, and she'd still be crying and going, Mommy, and I'm like, I'm right here. You know, so it was very, looking at the larger picture, right? So single parent, in a house, full-time job, other kids, and she's going through these emotional upheavals with no logical reason. And the tears would last, without exaggeration, 45 minutes was like a minimum. And as you came in, like I had Jill Scott on, it's one of my favorites. And then she would use Jill Scott because she has a song that says, um, we all fr cry when we feel pain. I don't remember what song it's in. So I'd have this kid using it. It was like, well, even Jill Scott says we all cry when we have pain, but like, it's not normal for you to do this every day. Like, where is this pain coming from? What is wrong? And she really didn't have an answer for that. And then I was like, well, you got to go up to your room. When you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But I can't. Um, it was stressful. I would spoke to her teachers about it. I'd spoken to her pediatrician about it. Um, didn't really speak to the family as much about it. Um, at that point in time when she was younger, although her father and I were separated, he'd visit and he said, doesn't happen with me. It's like, you let her get away with anything. So da, da, da. So it was more like, you know, you're too easy on her so she can do that with you. But she wouldn't, do, she wouldn't dare do that with me. Mm -hmm. um, so she did pick and choose. And her teacher said, well, she makes it through her day at school because, you know, she's trying to hold herself together. So we all have that a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. You're going somewhere. It's like, okay, I've got to put on my happy face because I'm going to be at school from this time to this time and she come out of school and fall apart. Come home, fall apart, and then it's exhausting and she falls out and she's asleep. She'd stress over helping her friends. I was like, you need to do your homework. She goes, but if I don't help them, then they won't like me. Well, then they're really not friends because they so should like you. 
So was she diagnosed with... Uh... She got diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorder when she was nine years old. And I was at Morgan Stanley then, and we'd had a workshop. And it's this workshop with someone from the hospital here, the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. An expert comes in, and they're talking about children with different disabilities. And as I listened to them, I was like, huh, this sounds like something I should look into. So I spoke to the doctor, and we talked about ways to get her tested. And at that point, the testing, it's their intelligence. And I think there's some aspect of it that's the emotional intelligence as well. So academic intelligence, she was off the charts. Whatever the highest was, you know, that's where she was. Um, but they said it's really normal for any really smart person, a gifted and talented person, to have depression and anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. She goes, you know, it was summer to go into, you know, have her go to therapy. She was going into a, um, a summer program at Choate Rosemary Hall. It was a summer science program for girls. I think it was math and science, but just for girls at this boarding school. So we figured we'd get her in therapy when she got back. She did well in the program. The youngest one is always, the youngest one in her class all the time. And she liked it, but was really homesick and had the crying bout. So we went to visit her every weekend. And it was only in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, so and she was nine when she was diagnosed? Yes. Okay. And it didn't, we didn't, we never got her in therapy until... I think it was just like trying to find a doctor, trying to find the time between her guitar lessons, her dance classes, you know, um, then just the social thing, because as a parent, you know, your life becomes their social life, mm -hmm. and it was two of them. So it was her brother in sports and her in dance and theater and trying to coordinate it, and she seemed fine. Mm -hmm. So we just moved on with life. Um, and then, uh, you know, she had a couple of traumas, so there was also, once we started in therapy, she was... 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, therapy started at 12, but that was after, um, you know, trauma. She had been a victim of sexual violence, so she'd been molested um, first time at 7, second time at 11, and the time at 11 was the one that was the hardest to recover from. And I, I mentioned them, they're an important part of the story, but to point out, like, from five years old, these crying bouts had been happening. So those were a part of her story, but some people always want to point out to like, oh, well, that's why. Mm -hmm. That's why she killed herself, because mm -hmm. it was that. I'm like, no, she was smart, she was gifted, she had depression and anxiety, she worried about her friends liking her, she worried about pleasing people, getting her homework done, getting a good enough grade, getting her assignments done, and then there were these additional traumas on top of that. So I can't say it was because of that. I do think that she would have lived a longer, healthier life had she not had these additional traumas. And then as, as much as we all love our young people and our children, there's these periods in school where children are just mean. Mm -hmm. So there were aspects of bullying because she was smart and she was beautiful. And so people were jealous. Um, her first suicide attempt was 2009 in, in October. Wow. Wow. We're in October. Yeah, um, that was her first suicide attempt. And it was a Monday. I was at work. And I got the call from her school because she was on a school trip. And uh, so I had to leave work and go meet them at the hospital. And it was like, wow. Like I'd been dealing with her mental upheaval and had never brought it into work. You know mm -hmm. how we are at work. You know, as much as you can keep your personal life at home, you do. And at this point, I was like, I gotta go to the hospital to get my kid. She tried to kill herself. I'm gonna have to let them know what's happening um, and get support. They were very supportive and I had to change my hours because at that point she was not released and she wound up being moved from one hospital to a pediatric site ward and did not come home for three weeks. And she was like 12? That, that was, two thousand. yeah, I think it was 12. Okay. The unfortunate thing with the timeline, I think grief is such an odd thing that things become circular and it's hard to, sometimes I lose the timeline. I kind of have to look at old journals or look at the dates in the calendar to really line it up because I feel like everything really hit the fan at 11 
and this was 12 when this happened, and then after that is when therapy started. Mm -hmm. um, and self-harm started as well at 12. She was cutting herself. Um, didn't know about it till much later on, because at that point in time when the body starts changing, you're already used to the girls, they cover themselves, they're embarrassed, it's like, oh, I've got these things coming out of my body, and you know, a monthly cycle and all of it is awkward and uncomfortable and embarrassing. And I was like, but it's normal, it's natural. And it's like, well, not everybody has it. And, you know, so you start to hunch in on yourself and curl in. And I just thought it was puberty, but she was also hiding um, the scars uh, that she was creating on her body. And you did so much. I mean, you all really kind of investigated everything there was out there. We did Seaway. We did art therapy, talk therapy. Um, she was on medication, often on medication, pretty much on once they started in low dose. And I was the person most hesitant about starting her on medication. And she wanted it. And I wanted her to understand that a pill doesn't fix everything. You still need to talk. There still needs to be therapy. This is not going to be a magic pill that's going to make everything better. You still have to go to therapy and uh, and she did so she wound up falling in love with her therapist but one of the challenges and us living up here um, by Presbyterian since it's a teaching institution quite often the doctors rotate mm. and so she didn't have consistency in therapy That's how you doctors. so and at a young age yeah. change is already difficult you know her suicide attempt um, were generally and she had oh, she had horrible periods as well horrible cycle so in addition, so she got the diagnosis of depression and anxiety disorder. And then when the suicide attempt started, you start paying attention to that. And I already knew she had difficult cycles and I'd worked with her doctor. I'd worked with, um, it's pretty much a natural sort of person. I've been vegan, I've been a raw foodist, I've been vegetarian. So now I say I eat food, but it's mostly plant-based, um, but I don't go above you know, fish mm -hmm. if I'm gonna have anything. So in having this diet that I felt was holistic and trying to manage some of it by food, I really started to chart her cycles to know, okay, there's going to be this emotional upheaval in addition to how emotional she is and what we could do. And it's like, oh, there's evening primrose oil. There's, you know, we tried, there was hypnotherapy, there was talk therapy, there was art therapy, and dance was definitely always a drug of choice. So we were always in dance classes, myself included. And um, I don't remember when I started therapy but it was really beneficial for me. But it's hard. Like people need to know when you first go to a therapist, like anything, you go to a mechanic, it's like this mechanic sucks, you go find another one. Somehow or another when it comes to mental health, we go see the first doctor and you don't like them and feel like, oh, well, I'm stuck with this, I'm not gonna go. You go find another one. I did not like the first two. And it was the third one I landed on that was great. I stayed with her for years before Seaway died and then after Seaway died. Um, one of my kids, not into therapy at all, mm -hmm. maybe got him to go to two or three sessions and all this time. The other one off and on, you know, in therapy. But I think it's been beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, when I talk about it, I tell people I'm not in therapy now, but I'm generally open to it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm having rough points and I do have rough days and periods of time. Um, even now, I love doing this work in this space, speaking to people about my daughter, about mental health, about suicide prevention, and I am a yes for all things. So I get a text message, can you teach a yoga class? Yes. Can you teach a dance class? Yes. Can you, te can you speak uh, you know, at a suicide prevention workshop? Yes. And then I look at my calendar. And my students know it, because I'll talk to my students, and I'm like, that Dion gets on my nerves. You should see her calendar. Like, who did that? Who did that? I'm like, oh, Dion did that. You know, I did that to myself. So. Well, let's talk about what you have after Seaway died. Mm. You've become such a huge, a huge advocate. You spend so much time speaking to different groups. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you do it and how it helps. I've always been a serial helper, is how I term it for myself. And I really do believe, just in terms of my personal and spiritual beliefs, that our dead, people that we have lost, however they've passed, are still with us. And I feel as though 
somehow or another, American culture hasn't created a space for people that we've lost in terms of tradition and culture. So I don't want to stop talking about her and I can't talk about her without talking about mental health or suicide because that was a pretty much a big part of our life. She passed at 15. She was diagnosed at nine. Her crying bursts, crying bursts of tears began when she was four or five, you know, in, as a kindergartner. So this was so much a part of my life before I had any sort of training. So once she died, it seemed like a natural way to keep her alive, to keep her memory alive, and to let other people know it's okay to talk about it. What do you tell people? Well, there's a, with the training, because I partner primarily with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So within the training I've had with them for the Survivor Outreach Program, Talk Saves Lives, um, Safe Assist, there's one more I can't remember, Safe Talk, I think. It's really looking at messaging when you're talking about this. As we know that my daughter died by suicide, but we really don't talk about method and how she died. So when we're talking about her, talking about her symptoms and what to say, and if you see something and you're concerned about someone, talking to them. So I had to get really comfortable talking about death with her. And if she's going to another parent's home, I need you to clear some things out of your cabinet. And most of her friends were comfortable with that. But here, if you're concerned about your child, don't think they're using it to manipulate you. Because this is what a lot of parents, like, they're just saying that, you know. Um, they didn't want to go to school or they didn't want to do this. And so they're using it to manipulate you. And it was like, well, you know what? There's a small possibility that you're right. But there's also a possibility that you're wrong. So it's better to look into it. And if they're using it to manipulate, why would they choose those words to manipulate? So perhaps there's a conversation they need to have with a third party. Therapy. What are the signs um, to look for? Like, remember how we were talking mm -hmm. about different points? Talk, mood, and behavior. Yeah. What, what? Um, talk, mood, and behavior. So with talk, it is, if someone is saying, I feel like a burden to myself, I feel useless, I feel helpless, I feel hopeless, there's no reason for me to live, I wish I were dead, I'm just going to kill myself. If somebody is using these words, you listen to them and also look at the other things and see about getting them help. If someone talks about it, you look at ways to get them help. If the mood changes, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, um, not eating enough, rapid weight loss, uh, weight gain, all these different things is, you know, because I definitely used food as a drug of choice when things got really bad with my daughter. Um, she didn't eat. She would just get really small and we'd have to, you've got to eat, I'm not hungry, you need to eat. I don't want to eat. Um, but of course, if other people were around, then she'd, <gasps> mm -hmm. and then they're gone and it goes, you know, right back down. Um, behavior, um, withdrawing from activities. So I said, she loved reading. She loved writing. She loved school. She loved math. She could have a fever. So there's something wrong if she doesn't want to go to school. If she wants to stay in her room, very social animal, even crying, she wants to do around people. So that's her specific. So drastic changes in what they're saying, what they're doing, and their moods. Really irritable. Rage. Rage became a big thing for her. She was always a gentle, docile person. And at some point, someone would say anything. She was very much a you know, LGBTQ advocate, um, an ally. And if somebody said something, it became a period of thing where people say, oh, that's so gay. She would just haul off and punch that person. I said, you cannot punch people when they say things that are inappropriate. And she's like, that's just so stupid. How could they? And I'm like, take it down. Mm -hmm. This is not appropriate behavior. So these were the aspects of her. Another one is giving away things that are really important to them. And um, I don't know if I told you before, I do have a dress of hers that she'd given me. Because before she died, 
She cleaned her room. Room was always a mess, but I'm always fussing about cleaning. So it's like parenting win. My daughter's cleaning her room. You know, she gave me this dress. I was like, what do you, you begged me for this dress. You know, what did you, why are you giving me this dress? She goes, mommy, you take care of your things so much better than I do. If you put it away when I want to wear it, at least I'll know where it is because you have it. And I was like, oh, that totally makes sense because she can't find anything in her room. So I had it in my closet. And afterward, I thought about it and I was like, you know, the hindsight is twenty twenty. You learn things. She cleaned her room. She gave away her things. You know, her behavior was easing, but she's also in therapy. She's on medication. So you're thinking things are getting better. Things are improving. But ultimately, it seemed as though she had a different plan, but I didn't know. So if you recognize some of these things in somebody, um, how direct should you have a conversation? Is mm. so many people afraid to have conversations? Or That's a hard one. Um, and I do get that question a lot. Uh, even I was at a couple of presentations this week and I said, you need to be direct. And really important in noting is when you're asking someone, are you thinking about killing themselves? You know, are you thinking about killing yourself? Being direct. Um, you don't, you may not want to say some people, you have to come from your comfort base and most people are not comfortable even saying the word suicide. But you don't want to ask, are you thinking about harming yourself? Because there are a whole group of people that are into or do or self-harm uh, as a means of releasing their pain. So they do want to live and they've created this as a strategy to help them live. And when I'm speaking to someone, if I know they harm, I've seen scars on someone's arms, like, are you being safe? It's like, are they cleaning whatever they're using? Right. So that's a whole nother aspect of having a conversation if they are harming. But if you've seen talk, mood and behavior in someone and you ask them directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? That's the hard part is if they say yes, because you want to get them to a safe place. You want to encourage them to seek therapy and you want to find out, do they have a plan? Because it might be an immediate call of 911 and getting them to an emergency room to make sure they're safe. And if they have access to means, to remove the means from their home, depending on who you're speaking with. Because that's one big thing that I was learning about firearms. Mm. Can you tell a little bit about the stats on firearms and, and suicide deaths? What we know with firearms, and we do have a whole nother talk save lives for firearms owners that I've you know, worked with, mm -hmm. with um, Customs and Border Control, as well as NYPD, that they need to secure them and to lock them. But the deaths that happen, if most, the, I think it's 70%, so I hope I'm not wrong, but it's 70% or more of the deaths that happen, or the attempt is with a gun, are completed. So when you're looking at the majority of deaths that happen, um, the de majority of deaths that occur due to a firearm, mm -hmm. They are completed and it's 70% or more because the numbers change. I feel like at one point it was 90%. So I want to take a safer estimate and say 70 or more, but it's definitely well above 50. The lowest number I recall is 70%. They are completed and, uh, and they're with firearms, with um, guns. So we have a whole thing in terms of partnering and working with people to say, how do you secure your firearms? Putting a lock on them. And I don't know anything about firing. It's mm -hmm. on my list of things I do want to learn. But I did learn from someone that is a firearm owner, someone that was a veteran. And she said that we were at a conference and she goes, you know, this whole myth that if you secure your firearms, if you need to use them, if you need to protect your family or protect yourself, you know, you're dead in the water because you can't get the lock off. She goes, it takes three to five seconds. You need to practice the same way you practice loading something, the same way you practice unloading it. You learn you can get really comfortable with taking the lock off of a firearm. It's like that is not true. And it was so happy to hear this um, woman stand up that was a vet saying it's a myth. Yeah. It's totally a myth. So you have to learn and they have to be secured. Um, why do we, we often hear lately that suicide is preventable? Because it's a mental, it's a, it's a, this is World Mental Health Day. It's a health issue. 
So if it's a health issue, in the same way we're proactive about breast cancer, about prostate cancer, and the same way we used to think that you know you had you were HIV positive, you had AIDS, it's a death sentence. It was like you immediately began mourning a person. But it's like, no, you find out you have something, an issue, you figure out how to live with it and how to treat it. So if I have a mental health condition, I can treat it. Because 90% of the people that die by suicide have a treatable mental health condition. Some are in treatment, some are not. My daughter was in treatment. Mm -hmm. She was on medication. As a 15-year-old, there are other triggers, other things that came into place, and she unfortunately did not live. But I'm not blaming the doctors, the schools, the medicine. It's a truly unfortunate thing. And I think with the information I knew now, it might have come out differently. But it is preventable. We all need to know what to look for, what the signs are, and be okay with getting help. We have to create a culture where we're comfortable talking about mental health issues. Someone, you know, if you are a suicide attempt survivor, if you are, have a diagnosed illness, if you are bipolar, if you are schizophren yeah, schizo um, schizophrenia, bi um, multiple personality, um, substance use, whatever the diagnosis is, really learning that it's not who you are, it's what you have. If you're diagnosed with breast cancer, no one says you're cancer. You know, there's this language we create that is not helpful. So the culture we're in needs to create a better culture around mental health. So if someone has been diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder, it's not, oh, you're bipolar. It's what you have. It's not who you are. What else? Would you, anything else you'd like to add? Whew. Thank you for giving me this platform. There's so much to say. Um, take good care of yourself. I think dance and yoga have been so much a part of my platform for healing and coping. So when she was alive to deal with the stresses of work. I was in financial services, had really long days, long weeks, extensive travel. Um, you don't always like your coworkers. You don't always like your boss. Have a voice and find a way to deal. You know, yes, you know, if, if your way of dealing is having a drink at the end of the day, fine, but find another way. Physically move your body, engage in conversations, communicate with people. Know you're not alone. Whatever it is, if it's, I suck at, you know, this. Well, you can get better at it. I hate my job. You can find another job. I need more money. Well, figure out a way, you know, deal with financial planning, read a book about it, go to the library. Everything doesn't cost money, but feel empowered to make a change. And if you can't do it by yourself, know that you're not alone and partner with someone. I think one of the many gifts I have is creating community. So, um, but you know, I'm going off to Kenya again and I teach when I'm there. Um, I lead, which I started leading retreats. So finding a way to connect to people. So whether I'm teaching a dance class, a yoga class, or leading a retreat, I don't feel alone. I still have things that I'm dealing with. I still, yesterday, sitting at the top of my stairs in my home, like so tired and overwhelmed by my calendar that I was just in tears trying to figure out what can I shift? But I love everything I do now. And um, even if I'm tired and caffeine's a food group, I've got my caffeine ready in there. <laughs> I'm going to have my coffee. Um, I like all the stuff. And do you feel that you're kind of keeping Seaway alive oh. through what you do? One of my hashtags is Seaway Lives. Hashtag S-I-W-E, Seaway Lives. Um, there's a Facebook page and a nonprofit, the Seaway Project, um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Everybody everywhere feels like they know my child. And I forget who actually met her when she was alive mm -hmm. or who only knows her through me. And we look a lot alike. Um, and especially I had short, uh, short afro when I was in school, a jerry curl back then. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she had cut her locks off and had a short afro and people had seen her and they'd be like, oh my God, she looks so much like you. So people, her peers, her, they look at pictures of us that I'll post on Facebook, social media, like, is that you or Seaway? Um, so she is totally alive through me. And as I share her story, she's now alive in you. So I feel like everybody that has met me has in some way met her and has been touched by her 
because the me I am today is really not who I was when she was alive. Some aspects of me, but I've gotten really passionate about living my life and how I live my life because tomorrow isn't promised. And because I lost my daughter, I wanna do really well to appreciate people now, to see people now, to connect with people. And if I only see you one time, we've had a special moment together that we shared and you felt seen and you felt heard because that last day with my daughter, it was, it was just a grumpy teenage morning. I don't want to get up. I don't want to take a shower. I don't want to get ready for my day. And it's, you know, I just wish I got another hug. So I'm big on hugs and connecting and um, I enjoy my life. There are some really rough days, but there's some really good days. And Siwe is definitely alive with me. I carry her with me always.